We are in a series called No Shave November, uh, but it's December the 1st and mine is gone <laughs> because No Shave November is also AKA No Kissy Kissy with Wifey Wifey. And so <laughs> that thing was gone at midnight. Yeah. If you're new, this series, No Shave November, is a series on the life of Samson. And I don't know if you were here last week or not, but Pastor Ryan absolutely killed it. It was an amazing message. But that was last week. This is this week. And so if you have a Bible or the Bible app on your mobile device, grab it and go to Judges chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, uh, that's okay. If you don't have the Bible app, you need to upgrade your phone. Amen. Amen. Uh, but that's okay. Everything you need to see will be up on all the screens. Let's dive in. Judges 16, verse 23. Uh, the Bible says the Philistine rulers held a great festival, offering sacrifices and praising their God, small g. Uh, they said, our God has given us victory over our enemy, Samson. Uh, when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, our God has delivered our enemy to us. The one who killed so many of us is now in our power. In the minds of the Philistines, Samson's life was a foregone conclusion. They had stripped him of his power, his prestige, and his confidence. Have you ever noticed how some people are never satisfied to see you down? They want to keep you down. Have you ever noticed that when you are down, some people want to kick you when you are down? They want to make fun of your failure. Your destruction is their delight. Samson finds himself grinding at the mill. His eyes have been gouged out. His body is bruised. His heart is broken. And all of his so-called friends are nowhere to be found. Because most people only love you when life is good. When life is good, you can find friends anywhere. They are a dime a dozen but when life happens, when you know what hits the fan, people scatter. Even those who said, I'm a friend to the end, are nowhere to be found. You call and you text them, but it's as if you don't exist. I wonder who needs this. The Bible says, half drunk by now, the people demanded, bring out Samson so he can amuse us. So he was brought from the prison to amuse them and they had him stand between the pillars supporting the roof. Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, place my hands against the pillars that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. It looks as if Samson's story would end with the enemy making a mockery of his life. But God's destiny for Samson was not destroyed by failure. It was just delayed. Samson asked the servant boy to put his hands on the pillars. A blind man moving by faith begins to pray and ask God, will you strengthen me one more time for your glory? Samson began to exercise his faith that had been to hell and back, yet God used him again to fulfill his destiny. And the Bible says that Samson killed more enemies in his death than he did in his life. Think about it. In all of his mistakes, in all of his failures, God still used Samson. In fact, go read the book of Hebrews. Uh, many people call that the Hall of Fame of Faith. And when you go and read about Samson, it's not about his failures, it's about his faith. Maybe, just maybe, your last setback was really a setup. I love how T.D. Jakes says that. I, I've been watching some T.D. Jakes. Maybe your last setback was really a setup to show you that God is for you and not against you. I believe there's somebody here, someone watching online, and you've been defeated in the past. But this time is different. Because this time your faith is strong. You went down so that you could get up. You cried so that you could celebrate. 
You lived in distress so that you could dance. You did without so that you could appreciate what you have. Oh, come on, somebody. Tell the devil the fight is on. And come hell or high water, you will never take me back to that place again. Yes, I went down the wrong path. Yes, I sinned. Yes, I disobeyed God's word. But I pivoted. I turned around. I repented. And now my faith is stronger than it's ever been. My mind is unshakable. And my aim is absolute. So bring it on, devil. Because he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Oh, come on, church. High five three people and tell them, pivot back to God. High five three people. Tell them, pivot back to God. At the end of Samson's life, he pivoted back to God one more time. And now I'm about to pivot. Right? Watch me pivot. Watch me nay nay. Right? Uh, there's no nay-nay in these hips, I <laughs> promise you. But I'm about to pivot and finish this message talking about our heart for the house offering starting on December the 22nd and ending on December the 31st. And, and if you want to give before or after, that's okay. We're not going to tell you, no, don't give, okay? <laughs> and so we are about to talk about the heart for the house. And so we're going to pivot from the Old Testament to the New Testament to John chapter 6, verse 1. John chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. And a great crowd of people followed him because, watch this, because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. People are following Jesus for what he can do for them instead of what he can do through them. But it's a process. It's a process. The Bible says, he that began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So keep coming. Right? Keep showing up. Because you are in the process. Look at verse 3. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. I'm thinking, come on, Jesus, just tell us. You don't have to test us, right? Just tell us. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. In other words, when you don't see a way out of your situation, God is saying, I already know how I'm going to get you out of that situation. How am I going to get you out of that storm, out of that circumstance of life? Look at verse 7. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each person to have one bite. I love this because Philip is like, yo, Jesus, Master, Messiah, bro, eight, eight months of wages is not enough money to give these people one bite of bread. This is an impossible situation. There's 5,000 men here, and some of them have wives and children. Do you see the crowd that's gathered to hear you preach? There's thousands of people. Look at verse 8. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will that go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, but not enough grub yet. Right? And the men sat down, about five thousand of them back then they counted the men so you have to see this moment there's probably 10 15 or 20 thousand people and the bible says jesus then took the loaves five small loaves and he did what 
Are you with me? Is it on the screen? I know you're full of turkey, like you're bloated, unattractive, hard to breathe. You don't let out the belt, but I need you with me. So let's try this again. And he gave what? Thanks. Why is it that we struggle to give God thanks for what seems like not enough? Or we give God thanks when there's an abundance of what we need or want. But why is it that we struggle to give God thanks for what seems like not enough? Verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had enough to eat, when their bellies were full, right? He said to his disciples, gather the leftovers. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over. I saw this for the first time. There's no fish. The meat is gone. They're just gathering bread, right? He said, gather them and fill 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And I get it, for some of you, you're probably thinking, preacher, Pastor D, brother, I I know this story. I know about the little boy. I know God multiplied a value meal from Bojangles. I know about the leftovers. It's a great miracle. I've read the story. I've heard the story preached. I even flannel graphed it way back when I was in Sunday school. So I I need something new. I I need something fresh. I I know all about this story. Do you? It is a great miracle. In fact, it's the only miracle other than the resurrection that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. God's Word is alive. This book is active. And the more you and I open up this book, the more you and I read this book, the more you and I allow this book to read us, the more we discover more than what we thought we knew. I've learned with every season of life, God shows me something new, something different in his word. And in preparation for our heart for the house offering, an offering that helps push and catapult us into the new year to experience everything God has for us, I read this story again this week. And God reminded me that no matter what we have in our hands, it's more than enough for him to provide a miracle. It's more than enough. All I have is just a little bit of oil. Go and get some jars from your neighbors. God said, give me something to fill. God always starts with what we already have. The church, the big C in the book of Acts, started with 120 people praying in an upper room. The journey church started with 13 people in a living room. God is a God who multiplies. But the key... But the key is to surrender what's in your hands. And we can't surrender when our hands are like this. Can I let you in on a little secret? When God calls you to do something, it always starts with what you have in your hands. And the disciples are about to learn a lesson that most of God's promises are conditional. And yes, God promised us every spiritual blessing in Christ. He did. But most of God's promises are attached to a principle before you can possess it. You cannot separate the promise from the process. Because it's the process that positions you to possess the promise. I think I'll say that one more time. You cannot separate the promises of God from the process of God. Because it's the process that positions you to possess the promise. Can I give you some examples? 
I'm going to do it anyways. Look at <laughs> Psalms 37, 4 on the screen. Yeah. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of what? Your heart. When our desires are a reflection of who he is instead of what we want, then he gives us the desires of our heart. Why? Because our heart is lined up with his heart. Look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In what? Everyone say all again. In all your ways. Not some, not most. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And watch this. And he will make your path straight. I could go on and on. Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Most of God's promises are conditional. They're optional. But here's my question. Why in the world did Jesus choose barley bread and two fish to be the only miracle outside of the resurrection to be recorded in all four of the Gospels? Think of all the miracles God did. And this is the only miracle outside the resurrection where all four are recorded. What seems insignificant is significant. And by the way, this bread was not a cheddar biscuit from Red Lobster, right? Or a roll on a chicken mini from Chick-fil-A. I love a cheddar biscuit at Red Lobster. And and that roll at Chick-fil-A, that's godly. (laughs) That's incredible. You know what I say, Brad? I say, kill the cow and let's put some filet on that roll. Kill the chicken and the cow. Come on, Chick-fil-A. Listen, this was cheap bread. This was like nasty, disgusting vegan bread. (laughs) Recorded in all of the Gospels. But John left some of the details that I believe created the provision. In the book of Matthew, it says the disciples came to Jesus with a suggestion. Look at Matthew 14, 15 on the screen. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. Like, we're out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know where we are, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Hey, Jesus, you've been preaching all day long. I mean, we love it. It's great. It's amazing. But the people are hungry. Send the crowds away. That's what Jesus' disciples said. Send the crowds away. I wonder how many times we want to send away the very thing God wants to use to supply the miracle in our lives. I'm going to let that sit. I wonder how many times we want to send away the very thing God wants to use to supply the miracle. Can I tell you from experience, the word that you need to hear is usually the word you resist the most. It's usually the word that makes you uncomfortable. The word that creates conflict inside of you. The word that gets all up in your grill and invades your personal space bubble. It's usually the word that you resist, you need to lean into. Look at your neighbor and tell them, lean in. Lean in. It's usually the word that you and I resist, that we need to lean into, that we need to embrace. Because God uses what we resist to release his resources in our lives. The things we resist are the very things God will use to release his resources in our lives. Can I ask you a question? 
are you leaned into where we are going as a church? Are you okay with more locations, more campuses, more experiences? Now understand, the Journey Church, we are not satisfied until every person knows Jesus. And I get it. Some people love small churches. They love churches where everybody knows their name. And we, we have that too. It's called small groups. <laughs> Live in community. Do life with people. But if you're looking for a small church, we're not it. We want to be part of a church where everybody knows his name. Because it's all about him. And I get it. Some of you are probably thinking, that sounds expensive. It is. It costs something to follow Jesus. It costs something to put him first in every area of our lives. Which, by the way, includes our money. Newsflash, when you said yes to Jesus, you signed up to bring back 10% of your income to God's house. And understand, he used the word bring because you cannot give what does not belong to you. You bring the tithe. You are returning back to him what is already his. The question is, do you trust him? And I get it. You might be in a place where you're like, preacher, Pastor Darrell, I cannot afford 10%. And I get that. We've been there. Can you start somewhere? Because if you never start, you'll never get started or never finish. Start with 3%. Start with 5 Start somewhere. Jesus is not Burger King Jesus where you get to live your life your way. If you want to be part of the mission God has for you, you have to lean in. You cannot be a part of what you are not leaned towards. Do you get that? Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, no one can serve two masters. For you will, you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I'm just reading the words of Jesus. Amen. This is not like Journey Church or Pastor Daryl. This is Jesus. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this is not judgment or condemnation. This is truth in love. I promise you, I've been there. Tithing was the last thing I surrendered when I gave my life to Christ. But I could sit with you for hours and tell you story after story of what God has done in our lives when we started tithing. I would not be here as your pastor if I never started tithing. I promise you. Let's get back to our story. I know some of you are like, please just move on. It's hot in here. Talking about my money. It's not your money. John 6, 3. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. When Jesus looked, what? Up. up. Hit the pause button. Download this into your heart and soul today. When you look up, it changes your perspective. When you look up, you are reminded that God's moved mountains in your life before. So you look at the next mountain, the next storm, the next circumstance of life, the next Goliath, and you stare him down and say, my God's got this. I've been here before, devil, and I've already bought the slingshot. So bring it on, devil, bring it on, because I know my God is Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. Listen, I don't know what you need or what you walked in here with, but Jesus said in John 6, I am. In other words, you don't have to worry about the how because the I am is all you need. When Jesus said I am, it's as if he left us a blank check and the memo line says, I am all you need. I am all you need. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If you are hungry, I am the only one that can satisfy your appetite. When life gets confusing, he said, I am the light of the world. No matter how, uh, how dark life gets, no matter how dark this world gets, I will guide your path. Jesus said, I am the gate. I am the way in and the way out. 
Do you feel trapped, stuck, locked up, locked in, unincluded, unwanted, or undone? Jesus said, I am the gate to everlasting life. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Have you lost your way in life? Jesus said, follow me. And I will walk with you through the valley, through the pain, through the hurt, through the betrayal. I will walk with you through the divorce. I will walk with you through everything in life because I will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I breathe life into dead and hopeless situations. Dead dreams, dead marriages, dead in addictions. Jesus said, I am the resurrection, and I have the power to breathe life into dead things. Jesus said, I am the true vine. When you hook up with me, you will always be satisfied. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the only one who can satisfy that emptiness inside of you. Jesus said, I am. What do you need? Just fill in the blank. I am. That's who he is. Verse 5, watch this. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. He's always one step ahead of us, isn't he? he he's in our future waiting. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. I read this over and over this week, this story, and it finally hit me, Brad. Philip is calculating. He's like, five loaves, two fish, thousands of people. Mm. I don't know. This seems like an impossible situation. But the bread of life is standing right in front of him. Miracles don't happen by reason. They happen by revelation. What Philip said or what he was thinking wasn't wrong. He just failed to look at the greatest resource they had. Sometimes you have to lean in. Look up and listen. Look at verse 8. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. But how far will they go among so many? Reason is about to intersect with revelation. Listen, God will never ask you to surrender what he has not already given to you. God says, I will supply all your needs according to my riches according to my resources. And by the way, my resources are endless. And I get it for some of you, what you have in your hands doesn't look like enough. And you can think of a lot of reasons not to trust, not to pray, not to forgive, not to stay, not to tithe, not to participate in this year's Heart for the House offering at the Journey Church. Because the voice of calculation tells you there's not enough. So don't trust. Don't pray. Don't forgive. Don't stay. Don't tithe. Don't participate. Because it doesn't make sense. Andrew said it doesn't seem like enough. It doesn't seem like enough. But here's what we Here's what we have. And many of you, you know the story. Right? Jesus blessed it, and they broke it, and they fed thousands upon thousands of people until they were full. And then they had 12 baskets of bread left over. Each disciple had a doggy bag. He said, but here's what we have. I don't know what miracle you walked in here looking for. But the I am is asking you 
What do you have? If you will just give it to me, then I will remove reason and you will experience a revelation. And honestly, that's what the heart for the house offering is all about. It's saying to God, here's what I have. It's not about equal giving or equal tithing. It's all about equal sacrifice. I'm placing it in your hands, God, for your glory. I'm releasing it in trusting you with the outcome. I'll be obedient and trust you with the outcome. That's what we've done as a church since day one. We've been obedient to what God has called us to do. And he always far exceeds everything we could imagine in our minds. And he wants to do the same thing in your lives. He wants to continue to do that here at the journey. And the heart for the house offering is all about God taking those resources and helping us launch into 2020 prepared for everything God has for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that your word falls on good ground people are set free in a way that changes lives forever I believe this and I declare it in this moment and in Jesus name father you have all authority and father you are sovereign now enable your people to see past their own perspective and have the kind of faith that lives by revelation instead of reason. Help us to see things through your eyes. Thank you, Father, for this church, these people, their commitment. I am honored and blessed to be their pastor. Thank you for allowing us corporately to be a part of something that is so much bigger than us. You are the bread of life. You are the light of the world. You are the vine, the gate, the good shepherd, and the resurrection of life. You are a way maker, miracle worker, light in the darkness, promise keeper. That is who you are. Let's all stand to our feet with heads bowed, eyes closed. And if you're comfortable with it, with hands lifted high in surrender, repeating these words after me God all that I have comes from you you alone are more than enough speak to my deepest needs I am leaning in I'm looking up and I am listening because you are the great I am and I will serve you with everything that I have now high five three people and tell them bring a friend next week to the Journey Church. Love you. Have a great day.